Hello, this will be a summary video of our learning outcomes from lab number five. So we had a circuit like this in the, constructed in the first part, where we actually have our 80 mega 328 placed here on the board. We have our seven segment display connected here, and we have a potentiometer connected to the ADC0 analog input of our analog to digital converter, which is the same as the C0 pin or the bit zero of port C. And if we use, every, if everything is correctly configured and we use our five volt supply as the reference voltage and as the high side of the potentiometer, then we actually can see numbers between zero and 1023 on our display here depending on the position of the potentiometer and thus the voltage on the yellow cable here. In this case actually every single step, every single bit of our conversion is roughly 5 millivolts, 5 volts divided by 1023 so we could convert this into a multimeter by just multiplying this number by five and then we would have a voltage in millivolts on our display here. We could set a decimal point here and we would have a voltmeter. We could calibrate it more accurately, um, but that's about it. So let's have a look at the code for this and how everything is configured. So in our code we have the timer overflow vector, the timer flow interrupt on timer 0, which is doing the multiplexing of our LED. Uh, so we have uh, all segments connected to the pins of port D and all the digits, the common anodes to port B. Um, I'm zeroing out all the higher bits here and then I'm shifting in a one to the correct position because that's where our pin, our LED anodes are connected to. And in the global array frame buffer we actually have the information which is supposed to be displayed there. If we look at the function which puts everything into the frame buffer. We have the function update here, um, which takes a 16-bit value and uh, yeah, extracts the individual decimal digits uh, so that it can show numbers between 0, 0, 0, 0 and 9999. Nine, nine. I don't care about leading zeros as you have seen on the display here. So leading zeros are displayed. Um, like here we have two leading zeros. It's just for ease of ease of use, ease of programming. Keep it simple. Good enough for this example. Then uh, in our main, the first thing we do is actually we call an init function. And what's in this init function, we initialize the output function of the higher four bits on DDRB and on, on port B and all the bits on port D are also outputs. These are our segments and the decimal point and these are our digits, our anodes. Then I initialize the frame buffer here with 0xff, uh, which would mean that all the LEDs would be off because it's common cathodes and a zero in a certain bit would turn the LEDs on. Setting up timer zero, uh, I'm not using the timer zero PWM functions. We will come to this in a second on timer one though. And for the waveform generator mode, I'm selecting mode zero, which means the timer will count from zero to 255 and restart at zero. And every time we get an overflow, we will get an interrupt, which actually will then go into an, our interrupt service routine and move the display one digit to the right and then the next and then the next. 
So this is nothing new. We had similar things in lab four as well. I'm selecting the divide by eight prescaler so that we have a clock frequency of uh, one megahertz divided by eight, 125 kilohertz going into the eight bit counter, which then gives us about 4,000 interrupts per second um, because of uh, the counting from 0 to 255 then with this speed. I'm enabling the overflow interrupt for the timer zero and I'm enabling global interrupts as well so that we can have interrupts. Then we have the analog to digital converter here and let's have a quick look at uh, that in the data sheet. So analog to digital converter is here. This is the register description. Wait a second, I'll turn that to you. So here we have the data sheet of the 80 mega 328. And we have here the Atmux bit, which describes for us for example, the selected supply for the reference. So let's see how it looks in our code. We have zero on refs one and one on refs zero. And according to this table here, we see that this corresponds to the AVCC with external capacitor on the AREF pin. For our purpose, we can actually neglect this capacitor, which would smoothen out any remaining uh, instabilities on the supply. We have add lar zero, which is the left alignment of our results. We will have a look in a second. And we are selecting channel zero here by having all max bits set at zero. We enable the analog to digital converter, we start the first conversion and we are not interested in auto updates. We are not interested in interrupts, but we have to choose a prescaler for the analog to digital converter. And also this we can find in the data sheet. Um, here we see the prescaler values. We have factors between two and 128 to choose from. And this is also then starting off with one megahertz. And uh, the data sheet says we want to be between 100 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz, preferably for optimal operation of the analog to digital converter. That would mean that a division factor of eight gives us once again 125 kilohertz. And the uh, division factor of eight is the fourth row in this table where you see zero, one, one. Uh, in the bits selecting. So we have a zero, a one and a one here. So this is then starting also starting the first uh, measurement. Um, however, we come back here after we have done our init, we get into our infinite loop here. And here we are starting a new conversion uh, in the begin of the loop by actually setting the ADSC bit to one. And while the conversion is still ongoing, the ADC will keep this bit as a one. And we are waiting inside this loop. We are polling the bit all the time. This could be done in an interrupt, but I didn't want to complicate the code. So we are in a polling loop here until the, this bit is zero, we stay in this loop. Once it's zero, we are reading out the value ADC and we are putting it on our LED display and we wait 10 milliseconds, just doing nothing before we go another loop, another time through this loop. So this is what the code was doing, which is running here, which we can see. And now I want to show you what the add lar bit 
can be used for. So we left a line. We have a 10 bit integer number. And bits from 0 to 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And this is the result of our analog to digital conversion. It's a 10 bit number, but our registers in our microcontroller are 8 bits wide. That means that we can show or handle numbers which are 8 bits consisting of one memory location or 16 bits containing two memory locations. So if we think of the standard case, we actually would have the 10 bit number mapped into a 16 bit number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A 16-bit number containing of two subsequent memory addresses where this is actually the ADC high byte and this is ADC low. Each goes from 0 to 7. 0 to 7 can store numbers between 0 and 255 but if we see it as a 16-bit number then we have 0, 7, 8 up to bit number 15 here. And in the normal case which is atlar equals zero. So zero at the position atlar. Then actually our bits map from the analog digital conversion result into the two result registers like this. And we get numbers which are um, the, this is the bit which is verse 512, uh, so we will get numbers which are between 0 and 1023. That's what we see on the display here. In the case of Adlar equals 1, the case is slightly different. So in the case of Adlar equals 1, let's try to Try to do it like this. We again have our result registers. With it with their eight bits. But now actually equals 1. Now the highest bit of our result here, bit 9, would be mapped to the highest bit in the high byte of the ADC result. Then comes the next one, then comes the next one, 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 the next one. and we have two left which go into these bits of the ADC low. So this is ADC low and this is ADC high. Together they form ADC. So if we want if we use the variable ADC in our code as we have been doing so far, then we are seeing all the 16 bits. And this gives us here now steps of 64 because this is bit 0, which is worth plus minus 1, or 0, 1. This is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. So if this bit here is set, we have a 64. If it's 0, we have 0. And then the next one is 128. Together they are 192. So that would be the steps of the result, which we could deduce. So let's have a look how this looks. And uh, this actually doesn't make much sense to use it like this, but we can see 
just what happens. So I'm setting the outlier bit to one here and the resulting code I transfer into our microcontroller. And now I go down to, to the lowest value here and you see there's a lot of blinking ongoing here. I try to move it so that the lowest result can be seen here. Well, it's very noisy down there, but there, there's a 64. So that is the lowest number which we could see. And we see that it already tries to go to 128 from time to time. But why, how, the, how can this be useful then? Well, it can be useful if we only look at the ADCH, because this will now be a correct 8-bit conversion of our analog to digital result. So if we're only interested in 8 bits of our result, we can get rid of the noisy lowest 2 bits. Okay. So what we want to do is actually we want to read off now the number or the 8-bit register ADCH. And uh, if we do this, so we take ADCH, copy it to value, print out value on the display, we compile this code, um, we upload it to the microcontroller using AVR do this, and we see what we see on the display. Now it shows 189. I can go all the way down to zero, or I can go up to 255, which is the highest number which we can have in 8 bits. So I have now an ADC conversion result of my input voltage on the yellow cable here, which is an 8-bit number instead of a 10-bit number. There might be reasons why 8 bits could be enough for you. Um, one thing which you can also um, notice is that we are getting rid of the lowest two bits, which are actually the most noisy bits if there is noise on our conversion, because the lowest bit is worth 5 millivolts, the next one is 10 millivolts. So we are getting rid of a noise which is below 10 millivolts by just skipping these two bits. So now we want to use the PWM function on timer one. And uh, for this, we don't need these papers for now. We will actually um, utilize that we now have an, a variable value from zero to 255 by means of our potentiometer here. Um, we can use this directly in our first program code. So if we look into the data sheet of the 80 mega, which I have here on this screen now, then we want to use timer one uh, and we want to use the PWM output A, the OC1A pin of this timer. On our microcontroller, this is the same as the PB1 pin here. I've already connected an LED as described in the lab instructions. And uh, we have now to look into the details uh, on what to set in these registers and what other changes we have to do in our code. So if we look into the data sheet, then we see that our timer has a control register 1A, timer counter control register 1A, TCCR1A. It has a B register as well, and it has also a C register. We don't we, we don't care about uh, the C register. It's therefore actually triggering interrupts by software. Um, we don't want to do this. So all we need is the bits in the TCCR1B and the TCCR1A register. So the first thing I'm uh, looking up now is what mode our timer should run in. And this table is a bit yeah, badly formatted. Um, we have four bits for the control of the timer function, WGM13, 12, 11, and 10. 
But, and so we have 16 possibilities, but we see only 13 rows in this table from 0 to 12, while the other three are on the next page in the datasheet, actually. For now, we want to use, to start with, an 8-bit PWM signal, so we are choosing mode number 001. Our timer will not run to 65535 now, as a 16-bit timer could do, it will only run as an 8-bit timer from 0 to 255, as our timer 0 is already doing. And uh, this means that we also don't need to take care about the low, or the, the high byte actually, of our timer counter control, or timer counter registers, or our output compare registers here. They can treat them as 8-bit um, values simply and everything will be 8-bit now on this 16-bit timer if we choose this setting 0, 0, 0, 1 in the WGM 1, 3 to 1, 0 bits. In the code I have prepared the initialization section for the timer 1 now in our init function and uh, that means that here we have our 3 or 4 bits WGM13 which should remain a 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 1 is 0 but the 1 is 0 is to be supposed to be coming a 1 here. That selects now mode 1 here from this table. A face correct PWM. And actually as I'm thinking now, no, I don't want the face correct. Actually, we start with the fast PWM instead, which means that I also have to set the WGM12 bit. Now we're in mode 5 here in this table. So the 1, 2 bit should also be a 1, like this. Then uh, we can have a look at the clock prescaler bits, the same as in timer 0, and uh, the table is also the same, so we have a choice of uh, 1 MHz, our CPU clock frequency, divided by 1, by 8, by 64, 256, and 1024. Uh, I want to run as fast as possible with this setup now, so we choose the divide by 1, or in other words, the full CPU clock speed for our timer, 1 MHz. Now let's have a look at what the COM1A1 and COM1A0 bits are for some for, for things. They, they control the generation of our PWM pulses. And here we have the description of the bits directly under the description of the whole register A. And we are looking for the fast PWM mode here, which we have here. And uh, it has something about disconnected, uh, disconnected, but here it says actually non-inverting mode and inverting mode. We want to run in non-inverting mode, so we set a 1 and a 0 into the COM1A1 and COM1A0 respectively. So a 1 and a 0. As I mentioned before, our output pins for the PWM signals are the same as the port B pins. Here we have the pinout of our ship in the datasheet, and OC1A is over here, the output compare 1, timer 1, A pin, and the output compare from timer 1, B pin. PB1 and PB2. In order to get anything out of this pin, we actually have to define it as an output pin in its corresponding port function. So this we do here where we have the output register DDRB, output direction, data direction register for port B. And port or pin 1 would be actually this bit here. So this, is, this here is bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3, bit 4, 5, 6 and 7. These four are already used for our LED matrix and now we are defining this pin also as an output. And now what are we wanting to do? We want to actually modify the pulse width of our PWM signal. And this is done 
by actually changing the value in the output compare register 1a for the a pin and 1b for the b pin. These are 16-bit numbers in two subsequent memory locations. We could either use and access them as 8 bits at one time or our compiler also supports to just use the OCR1A and OCR1B variable as 16-bit numbers. And we will do so. So what I'm planning to do here is actually to take our value, which we have just gotten from our ADC, and not only show it on the display, but also use it to determine the pulse length of our PWM pulses by actually setting the output compare register to the value which we got from our ADC, which we know is a value between 0 and 255 in our settings which we are currently using. And then we wait for 10 milliseconds and we go through it once again. And uh, let's compile this code and see if it compiles. Yes, 556 bytes of uh, code we have produced. I'll upload the code. So now the code is uploaded into our microcontroller and you see that the LED is dimly lit. Um, the ADC gives us a value of zero here. And if I turn the potentiometer, you can actually see how the numbers increase because this part of the code is still the same code, but also how the LED gets brighter at higher numbers and dimmer at lower numbers. So the intensity, the apparent intensity of the LED changes, obviously, but, but how and uh, what is happening here? So what I have here outside the view of the camera is actually an oscilloscope. It's the same type of oscilloscope that we have in the lab. And uh, well, I've connected everything up here so far. Let's see, putting it like this. And if I turn the breadboard by 90 degrees and put it up here, then we can still see the LED and the numeric value on the LED display here. I have uh, the oscilloscope probe here for the yellow channel and I will connect it to the output of the PWM signal directly at the port pin B1. That's where our LED is connected. And what we see on the oscilloscope, so it's connected like this now, what we see on the oscilloscope is this pattern uh, here. If we stretch out the time, then we actually can see, let me, yeah, it's a good trick here. Um, we have these pulses, uh, they, they appear to be about 50% uh, duty cycle visually, so they are on here, and then it goes off, and then the next pulse comes. The oscilloscope tells me down here that we have 3950 of these pulses per second. And uh, so they come at a frequency of 3.9495 kilohertz here. And it tells me that the duty cycle, so the ratio of the on time to the whole period here is 51%. So if I now turn the potentiometer, and this is at a value of 130 on the display over here. If I now turn this potentiometer so that we get lower values, like here, now we have 48 on the display here, and that's this value which we, meet, which we also put into the output compare register, as you remember. Um, the, what you see on the display is the same value that is put into the OCR1A register as well. So we see that we got shorter pulses. Now the frequency of the pulses is exactly the same as before, but we have only 19% duty cycle. And I can reduce them further until they are just these needle spikes here. 
um, we have a duty cycle of 0.39%, so they don't go all away at zero. We still have a small uh, spike, it's a very short pulse. We can have a look how long this pulse is. Uh, we have 500 nanoseconds per centimeter now, and this pulse here is exactly one, uh, two, two of these centimeters wide. So this is exactly one microsecond of pulse time here. Which is actually one over the clock frequency. One megahertz uh, corresponds to exactly one microsecond. So if I just slightly turn the potentiometer until it shows a stable doesn't show a stable one, it shows something. Well, this, this, this here yeah, I can get somewhat stable. This is three microsecond long pulses now at a value on the display of two. So we can check what happens if we turn the potentiometer all the way to the other side here. And uh, then we will see that we are approaching 245 now and we have a duty cycle of 95-96%. And I go further, we have 254, we have still a small short spike here of a microsecond length. This here is one microsecond, this would be two microseconds, and then we have sometimes three microseconds blinking. But if I now turn it all the way to 255, actually, we see that we also still have this one microsecond long pulse here. So we are, oh, eh, actually, sometimes it tries to be completely at a one. It actually does so. Most of the time, if, if we look here, um, no, no, it's not. So, Yeah, at 255 we still get, we don't get all of the spikes, um, but we get some. So at 255 we can actually reach a full steady line up here at 5 volts, the pin stays up, uh, but uh, because we sometimes get a 4 here, then we get still at some points these small spikes down here. But if we go to the other extreme below zero, even at zero, we, we still get this one microsecond long spike. How, how and why is this? Well, if we look at the description of our timer and its PWM function, then actually it says that when our timer starts to count from zero to its maximum value of 255, then at this time exactly the output pin is set to a 1 and it stays 1 until we have a compare match and obviously then the compare match for 0 is uh, also happening at, at least uh, one clock cycle afterwards. But if we go to half here 128 for example then we would get a pulse which stretches over half the period, um, then it goes down to zero and it moves up again when we hit 255, when we start over from zero. So by getting a higher compare value, we get a longer pulse. By setting a lower compare value, we're getting a shorter pulse. So this is in non-inverting mode. But we saw in the data sheet that there is also something which is called an inverted mode, uh, which compare, uh, is yeah, set by setting COM1A1 to 1 and COM1A0 to 1. Let's do that and have a look what happens. So we set a 1 here as well. We compile our code. So 
since you didn't see that, so what I did is I changed the one here. We have not uploaded it yet, so we have the oscilloscope in the screen now again. And if I upload this code, now we are at the value zero in the timer counter compare register, in the OCR1A. And we see that we get a duty cycle of 99.6%. So almost all the time our output is high. Uh, if I turn the potentiometer here, now we see that the lower part of the curve is increasing. At, at 255, uh, we have a very low duty cycle now of 3%, down to 0.36% in, in this case here. And it shows 255 on the display. So that's about the basic PWM functions. Now we also can see in the data sheet that we have fast PWM and face correct PWM. So what does that mean? In order to show you that difference, I will have to connect the second channel PWM channel, which is on this pin here next to it, and I connect it to the blue channel on the oscilloscope. I will also ground this pin over here, like this, and we have to do some small changes in the code. We have to, I want to have non inverting pulses here in both uh, channels now, COM1A1 and COM1B1 as 1, COM1A10 and COM1B0 as 0. And we also have to define the corresponding pin as an output pin. And we have to set a value into the output compare register uh, for the B pin, the B channel. And uh, since the, the variable for the A channel was OCR1A, the, the name for the B channel is OCR1B. And I will just put a 1 here, which should give us 1 microsecond long pulses. And let's compile this code here and we upload the code and we have a look at the oscilloscope so what we see here when we are at about halfway is that we have the short pulses on the blue channel and we have the longer pulses which are variable in length here controlled by our potentiometer position um, then yeah they they appear synchronous, they, they start at the same time. If you look here, this is a pulse from the blue channel. It's two microseconds long here. We are counting zero, one, and then it's reset to zero, the pulse here. Our timer starts counting here, and both, both pulses start at the same time. So independent on the, uh, of the lengths of the blue pulses, they always start at the same time when the blue pulses start. So blue pulses, yellow pulses start at the same time. I can make now the blue pulses a bit wider. Let's go into the source code and change the value for the B register and give it a 20. That's about 10% of, of the full length of it. Let's give it 40 um, as a value. We compile this code. We transition here, I'll upload the code like this. And now we have longer pulses on the channel B. They are still quite short. They are not, they are 40 out of 255. Um, I didn't sh show the duty cycle for those ones on the display here, but we can see that if we change the length of the yellow pulses, then actually they still, they always start at the same time. If we now go for the phase correct PWM mode, which according to the data sheet can be set by 
using mode one here, face correct eight bit, then what do we expect? So I go here and I take away the one at the WGM one two bit, replace it with a zero. And this puts our timer into face correct PWM mode, compiling this code, going over to the display here, putting it into a mode like this so that we see both pulses. And I will now upload the code. Here it is. And what we now see is that actually our blue pulses are centered within the yellow pulses. We see that the yellow pulse starts before the blue pulse and the blue pulse ends before the longer yellow pulse. So if we zoom in a bit here, like this, this is what we see. And if I change the widths of the yellow pulses, the blue pulses always stay centered in the yellow pulses, or if, if the yellow pulses are shorter, then actually the yellow pulse is centered in the blue pulse. The mid of both of these pulses is at the same time. They start at a negative time and end at a positive time. How is that possible? Um, in this case now, our timer counts up and down, and the pulse ends when our timer reaches a compare value on the way counting up as before, same way as before. But the pulse doesn't start at zero. It starts when the down counting, the down counting counter actually reaches the compare value on its way down. Then the pulse starts and when it crosses the compare value again while counting up, the pulse ends. And since this is done in the same way for both of these channels, actually we see this centered behavior here because we have a higher compare value in this register than in the corresponding register for the yellow curve here. And that means that on the way counting down, we first pass the blue compare value, the B value, then we reach zero for the, t for the counter here after a while. But before that happens, we also pass the compare value for this timer. Or for this channel. And then when counting up, the opposite happens. We first pass the yellow compare value, ending the yellow pulse, and then we pass the blue value, um, ending the blue pulse. To remind you, the value which I wrote into the B register was actually 40. So now we have 13 in the A register because that's our ADC output value here. So here our counter passes 40. Here our counter has passed 13. Then it reaches zero in the middle. Then it reaches 13, this pulse ends, and then it reaches 40, this pulse ends. 